my task is to tell you what happened in a little bit more detail than the picture book. I have two disclaimers. One is I'll be using some language that we no longer use today um, because it was what they used at the time. So gay as a overarching term, uh, homosexual, and cross-dresser, you'll hear those. Um, secondly, uh, I'm gonna tell you what happened, but we honestly don't really know. Um, all the details, it was a riot, it was um, chaotic, and there wasn't much um, coverage or um, documentation of it. Uh, what we do know, which is historically true, is that um, women of color, trans women, um, have been erased from a lot of this history. So before I get into that night, want to establish what it was like to be LGBTQ in 1969 here in this country. On the street, gays kept alert of police who enforced laws against cross-dressing and sodomy. In the workplace, gays had to mask their sexual identity or risk being fired. At home, they were rejected by parents or hiding in traditional marriages. In the media, if they were portrayed at all, it was to reinforce negative stereotypes or be exposed in local newspapers. In the government, gays were tracked by the U.S. Postal Service with the anarchists and communists as un-American subversive security risks. In the medical community, they were subjected, often against their will, to conversion therapy, electroshock, castration, and lobotomy. Being LGBTQ was a mental illness. In organized religion, gays were sinners and unlikely to be welcomed to worship. Unfortunately, this is still true. 2019, but not here. So what did LGBTQ people do to survive in this culture? A lot of them went to big cities to find others like them, and they went to gay bars like Stonewall uh, in Greenwich Village. Stonewall was the most popular of all the, all the gay bars, but not because it was a very nice place. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to explain the bathrooms, but just imagine the worst one you've ever seen. Um, they, don't, they didn't have um, sinks or rags to wash the glasses. Um, it was dark and bare and dank and it stank, but none of that mattered because Stonewall Inn had music and two dance floors. Almost no bars in uh, New York City at the time allowed same-sex dancing, even the gay bars. Um, so the young patrons of Stonewall dropped coins into the jukebox all night and lost themselves to Satisfaction by the Rolling Stones, Stop in the Name of Love by Diana Ross and the Supremes, and We Are Family by Sly and the Family Stone. Who went to Stonewall? Everyone we call LGBTQ now, but mostly they were gay men in their teens and 20s. Runaways, sex workers, the working class. White, black, Hispanic. Some lesbians, queens, and transgender people also went. The Stonewall was one of the few places, if not the only, where they all felt they belonged. So on June 28th, 1969, a hot, sticky Friday night, which I think we can all um, empathize with, <laughs> under a full moon, they danced. They were free. Meanwhile, across town, I don't I actually know if it was across town, that just feels right to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Inspector Seymour Pine got orders to shut the inn down. Raids on gay bars, including Stonewall, were not uncommon, but usually they would just take the liquor, make some arrests, and be on their way. But not this time. The cops wanted to shut it down for <coughs> Why? Here's where it gets very confusing, and I hope I have simplified it for you. Gay bars themselves were not illegal. They were, however, almost all owned by the mafia. The mafia was blackmailing some of the patrons who were closeted. These patrons ended up having to steal bonds to pay the black males, which caught the attention of the police. Um, and the police then wanted some kickbacks from this whole situation, which they couldn't get, so they decided, let's shut it down for good. So that was hard to prove, though. Um, what they could prove, however, was that their liquor license wasn't, for another huge confusing explanation, wasn't what it was supposed to be. So they went to Stonewall Inn to shut it down because they had an improper liquor but it was actually about police corruption. But it was actually about mafia extortion. But it was actually about homophobia. <laughs> Inspector Pine had a simple plan. Go in undercover, segregate the cross-dressers, and arrest one to make an example. Collar the employees, compensate the booze, and destroy the bar. Easy. As my dad in 
the 90s or 80s, whenever this was popular, would say, not. <laughs> I'm glad we're done with that. <laughs> the plan went south from the beginning. First, for some reason, dismissed patients congregated outside instead of going away. Soon, neighbors and passerbys and friends came to see what was going on. People who were there say there was just this feeling in the air, an energy, that something was going to happen. Inside, the crossdressers were not cooperating. Uh, here's another thing my dad used to do. Do you remember Arsenio Hall? Anyone? <laughs> That's what I feel like doing when I read that. The crossdressers were not cooperating. <laughs> that made Ryan very mad. So instead of arresting one of them, as an example, he decided to arrest them all. That made the crowd very mad. So instead of watching quietly, they began to make Poor Connie. Now he didn't have enough room in his police cars to take all the crossdressers to the precinct. He didn't have enough officers to manage the escalating scene, and he couldn't get a hold of dispatchers for backup. And then, <clears throat> and I stole this line directly from one of the texts I used, because I love it so much. And then there were the lesbians. <laughs> <laughs> People started throwing coins, bottles, bricks, squirrels, anything they could get their hands on. <laughs> Meanwhile, word spread through the streets. So Pine's like, cool, now I have a riot on my hands. Yeah. Usually with any kind of protest, the people hold out for a little while, but the cops eventually win. But this night was different. This night, the people, the gentle, angry people, had had enough. The cops had no choice but to take cover in the Stonewall Inn. They hid in there while all the LGBTQ people openly and freely had the streets. Now, as satisfying as I find this reversal now, um, the people did not see it this way at the time. Quite the opposite. Now it wasn't just the cops arresting them or kicking them out. Now the cops were taking their bar, literally in it. And one, as one participant said, if there's one place in the world where you can dance and feel full of yourself, and that's threatened with being taken away, those are fighting words. One unanimous thought rippled through the crowd. Take it back. They shattered windows. They tried to break down the doors. They set the things they threw on fire first. Hopefully not the swirl. <laughs> and after 45 minutes of this, the cops, cowering in the inn, were rescued by backup. The crowd dispersed. Until the next night. The next night, the cops sent the riot police. But even they couldn't outlast the people of Stonewall. People of Stonewall outwitted them. So the riot police in New York City are trained on like the very straight and narrow grid of New York City, but Stonewall is not like that. Much like the people there, it's crooked and curvy and queer. <laughs> and so the crowd control was more like a wild goose chase or a game of tag, in which the cops were always hit. Also, at some point during the night, there was a kick line. Riot police, I just don't think in any training in managing kick lines. So they just really had no idea what to do with these people. And that was the Stonewall riots. It lasted for several nights, several days. Um, although Stormy doesn't like that word. She says it was a rebellion. It was an uprising. It was a, it was a civil rights disobedience. It wasn't a damn riot. Overall, news coverage was very slim. Who, news editors asked in 1969, want to read about homosexuals? Raise your hand if you want to read about homosexuals. <laughs> the lack of coverage didn't matter. Overnight, the LGBTQ community changed. It became a community. It became a family. It became a movement emboldened with the strength and the love to finally say no more. So what a gift they gave us. To stonewall is to refuse to comply or cooperate with so this group of brave, audacious people at the Stonewall Inn in 69, trying to dance and grant one another a space for love and community, stonewalled those who wanted to deprive them of their human right to make that space. I am calling this the Stonewall Uprising instead of riot because it was a sacred action. One definition of uprising said that in the 13th century, it was a synonym for resurrection, a rising up from death. 
This definition holds up because oppressors attempt to kill the spirit by forcing bodies into compliance. And when we give an oppressor permission to define us and dismiss our humanity, our spirit fails to thrive. The Stonewall Uprising then was a resurrection of spirit, a reclaiming of self through a massive refusal to comply. The reclaiming of spirit is a sacred action that we can all partake in. There's been a long arc of small and larger victories for social justice since Stonewall, as well as backlash against these gains. I invite you all to think for a moment about the impact on our lives of this abbreviated list of events. 1970, the first Pride mar March, marches, there were more than one. Um, 1972, Title IX. 1973, homosexuality was depathologized and removed from the DSM. 1976, tennis pro Renee Richards, after completing sexual affirmation surgery, won a Supreme Court case affirming her right to play on the women's pro tennis circuit as a trans woman. 1974, Kathy Kosachenko in Ann Arbor is the first out lesbian elected to office. 1977, Harvey Milk in San Francisco is the first out gay man elected to office. The women beat him. <laughs> <laughs> um, 1979, National March on Washington for Lesbian and Gay Rights. In the 1980s, the AIDS was recognized as an epidemic as it began to claim so many members of our community. 1985, the Names Project quilt began as a movement to honor people who we lost to AIDS. It toured the country and it became immense. 1987, the group ACT UP formed a grassroots effort to end AIDS. 1990, the Immigration Act ended the exclusion of gay and lesbian immigrants. 1993, Don't Ask, Don't Tell became military policy. 1996, the Defense of Marriage Act was passed. In 1998, Matthew Shepard was murdered in Laramie, Wyoming, and James Byrd Jr. was murdered by white supremacists in Jasper, Texas. In 1999, California created the Domestic Partner Registry. 2000, Massachusetts became the first state to legalize same-sex marriage. 2003, the Supreme Court finally decriminalized same-sex sexual conduct. 2009, Congress passed the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act. 2010, Congress repealed Don't Ask, Don't Tell. 2015, the Supreme Court made, made marriage equality the law of the land. 2016, the Pulse nightclub mass shooting occurred, at which 14, 49, mostly Latinx, LGBTQ people were murdered. In 1969, members of LGBTQ communities were defined by dominant culture as profane, depraved, and profane. Think about how your own ideas about people who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, and asexual have changed over time. In 1969, when I was in high school, I don't remember being aware of Stonewall. If I was aware of queerness as an option, it was only as a fear that I might be perceived as that. The next year, I believe that I was aware of the first gay pride march, and I recall feeling shocked by the glorious audacity of the marchers. Now, thanks to what those marchers began at Stonewall, I am happily married to Amy, and people in our communities are claiming their identities on continuums that are broad and flexible, intersectional, and always evolving. 
Despite Stonewall and all of the other sacred civil rights actions, oppression is still so much with us. I see oppression as a deep fear of unruly bodies and as the attempt to control, subdue, or kill unruly bodies. I see it as the fear of women who choose what to do with their bodies, the fear of bodies that cross the border, the fear of black and brown bodies doing everyday human things, the fear of bodies going through the gender affirmation process, the fear of bodies that look different or are differently able. Um, in the documentary on Stonewall, one man said, we were thinking about survival. It was the one place where you could dance and feel yourself fully as a person. And they wanted to take that away. I see oppression now as the last gasp of people who harbor the illusion that they have power over others. I see oppressors as subconsciously knowing, maybe not one of them, uh, that their power is imaginary and afraid that one day unruly bodies everywhere will refuse to comply with these illusions, will resurrect their spirits, will create uprisings, and will take the spiritual step to define themselves on their own terms. Webster says that to profane is to treat something sacred with abuse, irreverence, and contempt. If we hold as sacred our right to choose our identities and to live freely in our unruly <coughs> dancing bodies, then it is oppression that is profane. Stonewall represents the moment for any of us when we take a stand and refuse to be diminished. It includes reclaiming the language that the oppressors have used against us. My prayer is that to honor Stonewall, we all claim the identities that bring our spirits to life, that we tap the internal wellspring of power that will not cooperate with abuse, and that we create love in the spaces where it has been lost. So it's my job to bring us home. <laughs> and I'm going to start somewhere where I didn't expect to. I want to start with a note of gratitude. Um, so I'll start crying, but as we all know already about me, is it's super easy to make me cry. Um, I feel immense gratitude that we're able to do a service like this, a community like this. And thank you for showing up on a Sunday. So I just want to name that. So, my life's work is creating spaces for queer and trans young people to be all that they are, to be seen and loved and perfect and whole and complete exactly as they are. It is my calling. I've been reflecting a lot on what this anniversary of Stonewall means for me, for my queer and trans students, for us as Unitarian Universalists, and I've found myself trying really hard to make some meaning out of this 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising. So today, because I like things that come in threes. I'm gonna share three lessons with you that I feel the Stonewall story provides for us in this political moment. Number one, it's not the moment, it's the movement. And yes, I am borrowing from Hamilton, the musical. <laughs> for those of you familiar. It is generally accepted by most LGBTQ historians that Stonewall was not, in fact, the beginning of the LGBTQ civil rights movement. It is a myth, but mythology matters. Like a sacred text, the story matters, fact or not. We hopefully all know at this point that Rosa Parks wasn't just a little old lady who was super tired one day and just had to sit down in the front of the bus, right? We know she was a veteran organizer. This was a part of a coordinated effort. And little old lady, she was 50, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> In her words, the only tired she was was tired of giving in. The real story of the birth of the LGBTQ civil rights movement is actually a little boring, as are the histories of most of our social movements. It's not that Stonewall isn't true. It is true. It just didn't happen exactly that way. Movements need good stories to stay alive. Stonewall wasn't 
the catalyst. It was the inevitable outcome of a movement coming into being. It was the culmination of years and years of organizing by nascent working class, trans, and queer people towards a liberation movement. It wasn't the first riot or the last riot involving queer and trans people fighting back against the ongoing, even incessant, police brutality and harassment they were facing. Now, today, as we face the wholesale rollback of hard-fought LGBTQ civil rights, it's important to remember the only way we get through this is together, right? We can't wait for a miracle moment. We must be a part of the movement now. All of us, there's only one thing to do in the face of power, and that's to organize. Lesson number two, there is no queer liberation without racial justice. 50 years ago, trans women, gender non-conforming folks of color and drag queens were central to what happened at Stonewall. The mainstream LGBTQ civil rights movement has all but forgotten this important truth. Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson are central to the Stonewall story. If you don't know who they are, please look them up. And we cannot let them be erased. Power has a way of infiltrating marginalized communities and shaping the ways we tell our stories. Even within the queer community, we truly struggle with racism and white supremacy. This is why it is imperative that we bring an intersectional lens to our understanding of social justice. As Audre Lorde said, or St. Audrey of Lourdes, I like to call her. There can be no single issue struggle because we do not lead single issue lives. There is no queer liberation without racial justice. All 10 of the transgender women that we know of who have been killed this year are black women. That means something. 49 people were killed at Pulse nightclub three years ago and the vast majority of those killed were Latinx. The gunmen chose Latin night. That means something. Stonewall is the story of poor and working class folks, drag queens, trans women, gender rebels, fighting against police brutality. The patrons of Stonewall, just like the patrons of Pulse, were there to dance. And I don't know of a thing in the entire world more joyful than just dancing. Now, as much as I truly want to, concerning all of my graduate work is in this next topic, I am not going to talk about intersectionality for the next 15 minutes, I promise. But, but, I will say this. Intersectionality does not mean that one has multiple identities. That's not the meaning. What it speaks to is how power, privilege, and oppression intersect based on the identities that a person carries. So, using myself as an example, the transphobia that I face as a non-binary person who is white middle class, educated, and a US citizen is very different from that of some of my trans brothers and sisters and siblings, right? Intersectional work is necessary for our progressive faith tradition. And here's the thing about being a progressive, y'all. It's a moving target. You are never done. If your views do not migrate with the times, then guess what? You are no longer a progressive, no matter what you did 50 years ago, or 15 years ago, or five months ago. When you can no longer be bothered to work for the humanity, worth, and dignity of a group to which you do not belong because you do not like them, understand them, or see them as too different from you, then guess what? You're no longer a progressive. And now number three. We've been here, and we're there again. We are witnessing a crisis. Our current political moment brings a new sense of fear and hopelessness to LGBTQ plus people across the country and our allies. The current administration is taking steps to allow homeless shelters to deny transgender people access and to allow physicians the right to refuse care to queer and trans people. Religious liberty laws are being implemented all over the country. The Department of Education has issued guidance repealing protections for transgender students under Title IX, we still can get fired or lose our housing in Michigan for being queer. New data from the Trevor Project shows that 39% of queer and trans youth considered suicide in the past year, 39%. One in five LGBTQ youth ages 13 to 24 attempted in the past 12 months, one in five. The current life expectancy for transgender women of color is 
31. As frightening as this political moment is, and it is scary. Those numbers are scary. We have to remember, we've been here before. Cindy talked a lot about where we've been, actually. We were sent to concentration camps during World War II, and when those camps were liberated, we were not released. The Nazis burned over 20,000 books on queer and trans identity, all but erasing all early scholarship on our communities. The HIV crisis began in 1981 and ravaged our community, and the government failed to act. And not for nothing, President Reagan didn't even utter the word AIDS until 1985. We have been forcibly committed to psychological hospitals due to our gender and our sexual identities, often by our own families. We have watched a Democratic president sign both Don't Ask, Don't Tell and the Defense of Marriage Act after promising to protect us and stand with us. We have been here before, and because of that, we don't want to fight back. Following Stonewall, Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson formed STAR. STAR was a radical political collective that also provided housing and support to homeless queer youth and sex workers in Lower Manhattan. When AIDS hit our community, we formed organizations, we raised money, we lobbied Congress, we nursed the sick and we buried our dead. Drag houses emerged in the New York City ball scene and became family to poor, queer, and trans young people of color. We've been here before. Resistance is in our DNA. Queer people have been a part of every significant social justice movement in recent history. Being queer and trans is different than being a part of a lot of other social identity groups. Our bonds of kinship aren't always forged by blood. Our families are often chosen. Siblings who have stood with us and for us when our families of origin couldn't or wouldn't. When we feel afraid, we can lean on each other. When we feel hopeless, we can be inspired by each other. When we are without, we can show up generously and give our hearts and empty our pockets. When we feel weak, we draw strength from the queer and trans warriors that came before us. I love us. I really do. And I'm proud of us. And we owe it to each other to fight for our lives. And I hope you'll fight with us. So in conclusion, the three lessons I have for you are, it's not the moment, it's the movement. There is no queer liberation without racial justice, and we've been here before. Or get organized, act inclusively, and remember your history, right? And don't forget to dance.